Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Rex. Today we're going to talk about surface tension, viscosity, and vapor pressure. So I'm going to jump into these slides right here. And we're going to start with surface tension. Surface tension is when you spill something, you have a liquid, and it's going to try to minimize its surface area. Why is it you can pour water on a counter and it bubbles up, it doesn't just spread out so that it's only one molecule thick. Surface tension is like that skin on the surface of the water. And that's what allows that bug there. Say, hi, Mr. Bug. Hey, everybody, I'm the bug. That's what allows him to walk on that skin of that water, even though he's more dense than that, is surface tension. How does surface tension work? Well, we have a population of molecules, trillions and trillions, like in a glass of water or whatever. Well, all the molecules in the center of that are gonna feel intermolecular attractive forces from all the other molecules around them. That's gonna be from all 360 degrees, the molecules above it, below it, and all around it. So it's getting an equal pull in all directions. But at the very top of that glass of water, that uppermost layer, they're not getting any pull from above them because there's no water molecules above them. So they're only feeling that intermolecular attractive force below and from the sides. And that's gonna pull them all in a little bit closer and a little bit tighter at that top layer. And what affects that? Obviously the intermolecular attractive forces. So the stronger they are, the greater the surface tension. We have two examples down here. We have water and we have benzene. And you don't have to memorize these numbers, but you can see that one is larger than the other. The water has not only London dispersion forces, not only a dipole-dipole, but also has hydrogen bonding. Whereas the benzene only has London dispersion forces. And that's why the surface uh, tension for the water is a much larger value. It requires more energy to get that water to spread out than it does for the benzene. That's what surface tension is. What affects it? The intermolecular forces that we just talked about, as well as the temperature. If you think about the molecules being close together and having that intermolecular attractive force, if we start to increase the temperature, we get more kinetic energy, they start to move around a lot more, and it's going to be a lot easier for them to divorce themselves from those intermolecular attractive forces. So water at 20 degrees is going to have a much higher surface tension than water at 40 or 60 or 80 degrees. You're going to see questions setting up comparisons. So we might give you three different molecules and ask you to order them from lowest to highest surface tension, or three samples of water at three different temperatures and ask you to tell us which one has the lowest surface tension. Really easy comparisons like that. Next is viscosity. You've probably heard of viscosity. Maybe you know exactly what it is. Maybe you just have an idea. It's the resistance for something to flow. So things that don't flow very easily. And you could probably think of a couple things right off the top of your head, like honey, syrup, motor oil are all examples of really viscous samples. Two of them taste really good. One of them doesn't. I'll let you figure out what that one is. Viscosity, you can see the values here again. You don't have to memorize these. This table gives us a really nice example and kind of a, a sample problem that you might see. So we have all these different hydrocarbons here, pentane to nonane. They only contain carbon and hydrogen. They only have London dispersion forces. So we have a really nice apples to apples comparison here. What's the difference? They get larger and larger and heavier and heavier. And what happens to London dispersion forces when things get bigger and bigger and heavier? They increase. So nonane has greater intermolecular attractive forces than pentane does. So it's going to be more viscous. And there it is. It's over three times as viscous as the pentane. What affects viscosity? The intermolecular attractive forces. The temperature, which we already talked about for surface tension, in the exact same way. Increase the temperature, give it more kinetic energy, more molecular motion, the viscosity decreases. It becomes more easy, more liable to flow. The other thing that affects it is the shape of the molecules. If you remember with London dispersion forces, things that are long chains that are flat, have a lot of surface area where the things can interact and experience those intermolecular attractive forces. But spheres only are gonna contact at one small point. They have much less uh, contact or surface to surface contact. So they're gonna have lower attractive forces. So things that are long flat chains are gonna be much more viscous than things that are spheres and their spheres are gonna be able to move and flow around each other much more easily. Capillary action. You've probably seen this in action before. If you've ever had a straw in your hand and some liquid, you'll notice that the liquid will travel up the straw of its own volition against gravity. That's what capillary action is, is the ability of a liquid to flow up a narrow tube against gravity. 
And you're looking at two different forces here, the cohesive forces, which are the intermolecular attractive forces between the molecules, and the adhesive forces, the interactions between the wall of that tube and whatever liquid we happen to be uh, dealing with. This example shows us capillary action. We have this purple colored liquid here. I don't know if that's something fancy like Thanos' blood or if it's probably just water with some food coloring in it. But you'll notice all these different capillary tubes and you'll notice that uh, the more narrow diameter, the liquid travels up much higher than things with a much wider or uh, diameter. It will not travel as high up. This brings us to what we call a meniscus, not the thing in your knee, but actually this little bump here or divot in the water uh, that we see when we have capillary action. So what we have going on here is the adhesive forces at the very edge of the tube between the molecules and the material of the whatever the tube happens to be made of. And we have the cohesive forces. You can think about all these little water molecules, like a bunch of guys holding hands, making a long chain. And of course, they're only so strong, so it's going to dip here in the middle before it goes to the end here where we have these adhesive forces again. Um, the weaker the intermolecular forces, the further that meniscus is going to dip. Well, what if we had super strong intermolecular forces, like over here, if we have metallic bonds or interactions, those are actually extremely strong. So this is mercury, the only liquid metal that is a liquid at room temperature. And you can see here, the intermolecular forces are actually stronger, the cohesive forces are stronger than the adhesive forces on the end. So instead of a bunch of regular guys making a hand chain, here we got Eddie Hall and Brian Shaw and Hafthor Bjornsson, and we get this positive div or, uh, or divot right here that actually rises up above the adhesive forces. Last, we're gonna get into what we call the molecular dance and vapor pressure. Doesn't that sound fancy? We call it the molecular dance because things are constantly in motion, even though we can't see it or we don't think of it that way. When you look at a glass of water, when you look at a tabletop, it looks static. It looks like it doesn't move at all. But of course, the reality is, is that the molecules, the electrons are constantly in motion. And because of that, there's a certain amount of energy. Well, some of those molecules are gonna have enough energy to enter into the vapor phase or to change phase. So here we have this large sample of water. This beaker is full. We have trillions upon trillions of water molecules. The vast majority of them do not have enough energy to enter into the vapor phase, but some small percentage do. So if we think about that, we have these nice pretty graphs right here. In blue, we have this sample of water, this entire water population, all the water molecules are gonna be represented under that blue line, the area under the curve. And we have this dashed line right here that represents the amount of kinetic energy that those molecules are gonna to need to divorce themselves with their intermolecular forces and go into the vapor phase. Well, you can see in this little purple area here, the area under the curve, it's a pretty small fraction of those molecules that will have enough kinetic energy to do so. If we start to increase the temperature, if we give those molecules more energy, you'll notice the shape of the curve changes. We have this red curve now, and the area under the curve with enough kinetic energy to enter into the vapor phase increases. This orange area, of course, has a much larger uh, or much larger area than the purple area right here. So the higher the temperature, more evaporation we're gonna see. The opposite of evaporation is condensation. So within those vapor molecules, the same way. They have some distribution of energy, some small fraction of them won't have enough energy to stay in the vapor phase, so they're gonna condense into the liquid phase, something you've seen before. And of course, if we reduce their energy even further, if we make it colder and colder and colder, we'll see more and more and more condensation. So both these processes actually will happen oftentimes at the same time, even though you're not aware of it or you can't see it. We'll have some amount of water that's evaporating and some amount of water that's condensing. Of course, the intermolecular attractive forces, again, are what affect this. So things that have very strong intermolecular forces are gonna require more energy to enter into the vapor phase. So we're gonna see a much smaller rate of evaporation. And things that have weaker attractive forces will evaporate much more easily and we'll see a larger rate of evaporation. Things that evaporate very easily are said to be volatile. Things with very weak intermolecular attractive forces like gasoline, acetone, fingernail polish remover, and things that do not evaporate easily, things with large intermolecular forces are said to be non-volatile, like water or motor oil. 
What does this mean in terms of uh, actual numbers? How can we measure this, quantify this? Well, evaporation is an endothermic process. That means we have to put energy into it to get it to happen. It makes sense. And uh, it has a positive sign. So we call that the heat of vaporization. So everything's been conceptual. It's been nice and easy, right? Well, now we have more weird uh, letters and numbers so that we can scare you and make you start doing math. So this is known as the heat of vaporization, delta HVAP, the enthalpy of vaporization. And it's specific to every substance and different for every substance. Now, you'll see a bunch of numbers here. You don't have to memorize any of those though. Just know that water is gonna have a specific enthalpy of vaporization and acetone is gonna have its own. Um, and you can see how those intermolecular attractive forces come into play here. Water, very strong intermolecular attractive forces, very large heat of vaporization compared to diethyl ether, which only has London dispersion forces or weaker intermolecular attractive forces, much lower enthalpy of vaporization. You can see we have certain enthalpy of vaporization at the boiling point of the substance and also at room temperature. Any problems you encounter are going to tell you what uh, that enth or what that temperature is that you're dealing with. So you'll know which of those numbers to use. One other thing, since condensation is the opposite of evaporation, evaporation is endothermic, condensation is exothermic. And whatever that value is for the uh, evaporation or vaporization, the condensation is the opposite. It takes 40.7 kilojoules to evaporate a mole of water. It releases 40.7 kilojoules if we condense a mole of water. This brings us to our vapor pressure. Again, how easily is it, uh, or how easily are these things evaporated or not? Um, and if we have a closed container like this right here, you can see, hopefully, there's a certain level of water in here. This remaining volume is known as the headspace. So some amount of the water in here is naturally going to evaporate, and once it enters into the gas phase, it's going to create pressure in the rest of this vessel. Well, if this is non-volatile, the amount that evaporates is going to be very low, and the vapor pressure in here is also going to be very low. If it's a volatile substance, it's going to evaporate very easily. We're going to get more gas in this headspace, more pressure. So we're going to say that that has a higher vapor pressure. That's what vapor pressure means, is how much pressure are we getting in that particular space, typically in a closed container. Lastly, um, we're going to do the sample problem here. Calculate the mass of water that can be vaporized with 155 kilojoules of heat at 100 degrees C. So back to our folder here. So they gave us our energy. They told us what the substance was, and they told us what the temperature was. And what they want us to find is the mass. So we should be able to, using that table and that enthalpy of vaporization, find the mass. We know how much energy. We need to find the mass. So what do we have that will get us from energy to moles? That should be the enthalpy of vaporization, which we can get from our table. And how do we go from moles to grams? We should be able to use the molar mass of the substance to do that. So here we have our enthalpy of vaporization in moles and kilojoules. And here we have our molar mass in grams and moles. So first of all, how do we get from energy to moles? We're going to use that enthalpy of vaporization. We're going to divide by that. That'll cancel out our kilojoules and leave us with moles. And then how do we go from moles to grams? We're going to multiply by the molar mass, canceling moles and being left with grams. We can do it as one long uh, step like this, or we could do one step and then come and do the second step. It's however you want to do it. Going through, you see we cancel kilojoules, cancel moles, and we're left with grams. Now, the amount of energy that we started with, 155 kilojoules, you'll notice that's much larger than the enthalpy of vaporization for one mole. In fact, it's about four times larger. So it makes sense that our mass is about four times what our molar mass would be. If for some reason we came up with only 18 grams or less than 18 grams, we could tell right away that we'd probably done a misstep somewhere, maybe multiplied when we should have divided or vice versa. And that's that check right there. You should always be able to do a simple logic check a lot of times on the problems uh, to let you know, did you go about this the correct way or did you, did you take a misstep somewhere? Go back, fix it. All right, we'll try this now on the tablet. I'm going to work through this. I've been practicing with this. So I've gone from writing like a drunken toddler to writing like a normal toddler. So this is going to be spectacular. You get to see my handwriting now. 
uh, like that of any wonderful four-year-old, maybe even as good as a five-year-old. So they told us that we started with 90 grams of this substance, C3H7OH, and they told us uh, what the substance was. We can look that up, find the enthalpy of vaporization for that. That is 39.9 kilojoules per mole, and they want us to find out um, what is the total amount of energy that it's going to take to evaporate or boil this 90 grams of this substance. So here we have grams, here we have kilojoules of mole. We want to find out at the end the energy, so we want to get to joules. So we have to cancel these, or cancel moles out of that to be left with that. So what do we have that'll get us from grams to moles? The molar mass. So let's find the molar mass of the C3H7O8. We're going to look on the periodic table, find the mass of each of these. So we have three carbons. Their mass is 12 grams per mole. So that's 36 grams. We have eight hydrogens. I'm just going to use one instead of the 1.008 because it's going to be very close and it's going to save us some time. But you can certainly do 1.008 grams if you like. And then we have one oxygen has a mass of 16. So I'm going to add up all of those components and we should see that this has a molar mass of about 60 grams per mole. So now I need to go from grams to moles. So I'm going to take my 90 grams of my substance. I'm going to divide by the molar mass because that will allow me to cancel out grams and be left with moles. We should have 1.5 moles of the C3H7O8. Now we need to go from moles to energy. So same way, how can I set these up so I can cancel out moles and be left with the total amount of energy that it's going to take to evaporate that? In this case, we're just going to multiply them. So there's my 39.9 kilojoules per mole times my 1.5 moles. Moles cancels, and our final value is, what was it, 58.85, I believe. Sorry. 59.85. So 59.85 kilojoules is the amount of energy we will need to put into this to evaporate or vaporize that 90 grams of that substance. Always watch your units. Be sure that they want the final answer in kilojoules. If for some reason they ask for it in joules or something else, make sure you convert and your final answer agrees. Uh, that's everything with this. Please give me feedback on this video. Let me know what I can do to make these better for you. Uh, I look forward to making more of these. I hope you found it helpful. Have a great day. Peace.